Hello, and welcome to Credibly Challenged, a podcast about bank risk management. My name is Matt Bizantz, and I'm a partner in Mayor Brown's bank regulatory practice. Joining me today is Till Schurman. He is a partner at Oliver Wyman, the consulting firm, and he is, among other things, the co-head of their finance, risk, and public policy practice. Um, Till has an interesting background that we're going to talk more about today, having worked um, at the Federal Reserve, having worked on many international projects, and also, unlike many of the other people who have been on our program, he actually has a background in economics with his with his PhD in economics, so he's a really smart guy. Um, but today, I think we're going to talk about some of the things that he has seen in his career and, and what kind of wisdom he has for our audience. Um, again, focusing on, on bank risk management and how it has become a huge topic and continues to be a huge topic for many of the listeners to this podcast. Um, Till, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. This is going to be fun. So let, let's ju- jump in on something that I find fascinating just because I'm I'm a, a longtime student of, of of many fields. But you started out with a Ph.D. in economics, pretty Ivy Tower degree. How did you get involved in in the, the day to day operational aspects of managing risks and stress testing? Um, well, I tell you, this 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 wasn't the plan Uh from uh, from the moment that I started graduate school, I started graduate school with the intent of becoming an academic. Um, my uh, dissertation actually had what turned out later. I didn't even know at the time quite a lot of use, uh, you know, some use in um, in uh, in risk management, as I'll expand in a second. Um, my first about of uh, grad school actually was at Bell Labs, where uh, I got started in this, I sort of fell into it uh, by looking at fraud detection on the phone network back then. Uh, and that got me essentially down the road uh, of, uh, uh, of risk management. My dissertation, uh, among other things, I did econometrics, uh, touched on models that looked at uh, limited dependent variables <clears throat> and uh, such as binary ones. So default, not default, pay, don't pay, um, core to to risk management issues. So when you say you looked at at phone system fraud, the the only thing I can remember is that scene in the movie, I think, where um, Steve Wozniak has the little whistle that he's using to try to trip the long distance signal back in in the early 80s. Is that the kind of stuff you were looking at? That's that's what we were trying to catch. Exactly. (laughs) One of the things that actually that sensitized me to is you chase um, you want to chase the, the big fish. So if the phone you know, bill at, at the time, the long distance bill was, I don't know, say 50, this is a long time ago, so $50 a month, you don't go after those, you go after those that rack up thousands of dollars a month. Mm-hmm. Of course, the problem is those are also, when they're legit, the best customers. Mm-hmm. So it introduced an e- interesting economic problem, a business problem of how do you trade off you know, in the false positives? Uh, in other words, you think they're bad guys, but they're not. From the false uh, negatives, you think they're good guys, but they turn out to be bad guys. Uh, and that that made an interesting uh, technical problem into an interesting business problem. Interesting. Well, then that's interesting to hear. So after that, uh, after a few other stops, like you said, you went to the government before. Now you come back to Oliver Wyman. Um, how was that practice from going from government life to, to back to being a consultant again, um, uh, billing by the day or by the hour? What was that like for you? Well, so, um, you know, my time at the at the New York Fed was was remarkable uh, and amazing um, to be involved, uh, you know, early on just in uh, supporting policy. I was a research economist there. Um, and then when the crisis hit, crisis hit to be, you know, sucked into crisis fi- firefighting and have a front row seat. A lot of the, um, uh, so, you know, I, I, my, my internal client, if you will, was, was bank supervision. Uh, it was mm-hmm. not working on monetary policy um, uh, because my research at the time had really gravitated over uh, very much to risk management and particularly risk management in, the, in banking. Mm-hmm. Um, and so there's nothing like a financial crisis to to focus the mind uh, on risk management, <clears throat> as we're learning again in the last few months. Um, I was involved quite heavily in the 2009 bank stress test, uh, which then got me down the road of stress testing. It wasn't the first time I had encountered stress testing, but it certainly got me down the road very solidly. 
Um, a lot of work at the Fed actually is it has a kind of project feel. Uh, you work on a problem for a few months um, and then you move on to the next problem. Uh, so um, the SCAP, of course, was a very large project uh, that went on for a few months and it spawned all kinds of things. But in that sense, the, the transition from a from a kind of work style perspective was was not as different as I thought it might have been. Um, and of course, the timing was very good. I moved left the Fed in 2011 um, uh, because uh, not only was that sort of the beginning of the wave in the United States of the, uh, the what became the CCAR program, but also um, uh, the dawn essentially of the, well, it had dawned before, um, of the sovereign uh, crisis in Europe that required a whole bunch of um, stress tests uh, at the system level. Uh, so our firm did Spain in 2012, for example. I spent a long hot summer in Madrid in 2012, which was really super interesting. And then in 2014, we supported the European Central Bank in their first ever uh, uh, comprehensive assessment and stress test uh, that the ECB ran, as opposed to um, uh, some of the, the previous ones that didn't go so well run by other entities. Uh, in Europe. Uh, and um, so for many, many years, it was sort of all stress testing all the time uh, until things uh, simmered down uh, in Europe and then also in, in the US when the CCAR program became really quite mature in the late uh, 20 teens. So one one trend that I, I, I've seen on the legal side with with CCAR and similar stress testing, I don't know if you've seen it on, on the design and, and, and technical side, it seems that there's more and more focus in in the, the banks on on um, documenting how they're operating the program, documenting on how how they're challenging results. That I'm, I'm seeing more and more involvement from um, second and third line of defense. More things around documentation of well, how did how did you execute it? Who's reviewed it? Who's signed off on on these uh, exceptions or assumptions? And and almost. And this is probably just from my simplistic legal perspective. The underlying stress test becomes secondary to the the, the process that is is around it. And, and banks talk about standing up their annual process. Um, what have you been seeing in in that balance between executing versus um, documenting or managing? So um, the trend that you described is is completely consistent with what I saw. Um, and what I've seen, that uh, theme actually even comes out in the just issued bar report um, on SVB uh, and the supervisory uh, kind of, uh, you know, background around it. This emphasis on and in hindsight, oh, perhaps overemphasis on process governance documentation. Um, so there's a glass half full and a glass half empty view of this. We've been focused on em half empty, and I'll, I'll I'll come a little bit more to that. Uh, we'll dig into that a bit more because you raise a really important point, I think, and we're drawing lessons from it now. So the glass half full view is um, the initial uh, CCAR program uh, was um, a lot about, well, the very initial program was just do the banks continue? Do they really, really have enough capital? Because we had a bunch of quantitative failures early. Once that's done and took a couple of years, the, sh the focus really shifted to like beefing up risk management control um, genuinely, right? And then uh, it became a bit more routinized. So um, risk management and control are processes. Right. They are um, and they require a lot of um, a lot of what goes wrong in risk management are actually um, issues in governance, uh, poor decision making, uh, poor information that comes in th uh, into the process of decision making. Um, so it's not surprising that the focus shifted to that, you know, the, the, the supervisory focus shifted to the internal process uh, uh, management. And, you know, there is a view in the supervisory community, understandable that if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. Uh, so please write it down. And it sort of took on a life of its own. It really became the dominant momentum, unfortunately. Also, because there was a nice long period of quiet. That has changed. It changed actually quite radically with the pandemic. And the focus <clears throat> shifted already um, uh, both at banks 
and at the supervisor community with the pandemic. And it's ratcheted up another notch just in the last, uh, I'd say in the last year um, plus. So really starting with the uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine that generated a lot of shocks across the system. Importantly, it also came actually in the middle of the 2022, uh, you know, stress testing uh, cycle. Um, uh, so, um, and then now the current bank um, turmoil is once again in the middle of a cycle, uh, although, not, not, you know, just for the largest banks. So a constant reminder that there are real risks out there that should be managed uh, rather than just the processes that should be buttoned up for the for the programs that you've got underway. The one one tension, I guess, to that is that that um, there are some kinds of infrequent stress events. And, and again, I don't know if the current ones that we're experiencing or some of the ones you listed are necessarily in, in the in, infrequent category. But certainly this this is something I, I see in a day to day practice is, is, you know, there's my routine type work that I do. And, and, and then there is the, the odd question that someone raises or the specialized question. And, you know, it might be really interesting, but I'm not going to see it again for five years. And and and. Do you think there is a, a skill set that is is better um, or things that you've seen in your experience where some people thrive better on on that day to day routine and, and other people are are maybe the better firefighter, you know, running in to, to tackle the immediate problem? That I, That's an excellent uh, question, Matt. Um, mm -hmm. That is a really very good question. So um, I'm not sure that we so the short answer is I think Yes, there are. If if your role <clears throat> is to worry more about, let's you know, relatively high frequency BAU type um, risk management <clears throat> and the moderate stresses, um, let's say that you explore also to define um, risk limits and to probe risk limits. <clears throat> right, most li risk limit architectures have multiple tripwires. Right. Um, and so this kind of more BAU business as usual type um, probing and stress testing, if you will, um, is more sort of on the, you know, the the, the first trip wires mm -hmm. um, rather than the, you know, break the glass trip wire, <clears throat> the break the glass trip wire, the more serious, you know, more comprehensive uh, rare event type stresses. It's just easier. I have found over the years for individuals that a have. Uh, are are not super in the weeds uh, to be able to step back and focus their mind and attention to risks that are you know might come out of left field that are worth paying attention to. There's a gazillion things that might come out of left field. What's hard, and I think this is partly what you're probing, is is to select the ones that I should pay attention to. We keep getting surprised by that. So I think one of the lessons for me anyway, particularly of the last three years, is you know, that aperture has to be widened continuously. You know, it sucks, but that's life. Um, yeah. It also opens increasingly for me uh, the imperative to have stress test risk management uh, groups, but particularly stress scenario design committees, let's call them for lack of a better term, mm -hmm. to be really interdisciplinary. So, for example, um, geopolitical risk was uh, was a uh, was something that you know, few banks had genuine country and political risks departments it used to be much more common. Um, I think with the invasion of Ukraine, uh, that has really uh, shifted. Um, uh, we're noticing a lot more attention paid to and formal pay attention paid to geopolitical risk. Mm -hmm. uh, it's helpful to have political scientists and uh, international relations people at the table that think about this rather than, you know, econometricians. Mm -hmm. um, so this notion of having a broader team, different disciplines um, uh, is, I think, for those, for, for those, you know, inner trip wires that break the glass mm -hmm. kinds of risk scenarios, I think is pretty critical. I don't, you know, you asked the kind of, uh, I, I don't think it has anything to do with skills or talents or anything like that. Uh, I think it's just very difficult inherently to be able to step back and widen the aperture if your job is to, you know, worry about um, the the outer tripwire. That makes sense, and and I'm glad you brought up interdisciplinary teams because that that was something that 
I think a lot of listeners, because we, we have a crossover between risk management and, and lawyers, um, and, and certainly over the last few years, I've been working more and more with, with people in risk management, uh, again, uh, economists like you, um, technical design people, modelers, even even coders on on things. Um, and and it's it, it's it, it's interesting to see how everyone approaches from from their background. And and I'll just say r- lawyers are are not the most flexible people. We 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 don't necessarily do well with uncertainty that that um the, the stereotype of law and order with um uh, Sam Watterson up there for the last 35 years like that that hasn't changed in 35 years of of how law and order is presented uh meanwhile your profession has just gone underground revolution after revolution um so how how is your relationship when when you've had to work with with lawyers either in house or external um on on stress testing type things how has that been for you so i have to tell you that i um, gained a huge amount of respect for lawyers during the financial crisis. So until that point, I'd had almost no interaction professionally with uh, with a, with with members, you know, with members from legal, uh, either in the private sector uh, or or at the Fed. That changed radically with the financial crisis. When we had to, you know, there were questions about what what, what it was and wasn't allowed to be done uh, under the Federal Reserve Act, um, but also lots of other knock-on questions that at the time I wasn't I w- wasn't sensitive to, but in working with legal uh, became quite clear. What I appreciated especially was the rigor of thinking. So um, the lawyers that I worked with had your profession teaches individuals to think very logically and very organized and very c- uh, critically through issues. So I really appreciated that. There's a kind of a, a discipline and a structure uh, that they brought to the table that I think was quite complementary, actually, to the more, you know, partly, you know, theoretical work, the theoretical thinking that economists uh, brought in uh, and you know, the the risk managers are a lot more comfortable. They have to be more comfortable with ambiguity and uncertainty. That's the business. Mm-hmm. Um, and that I thought was super complementary to the skills that the to, that the lawyers brought to the table, who, yes, they have a, a narrower aperture, but they have a discipline of thinking that I think is just was hugely valuable. Good. I'm, I'm glad to hear that. It's a, uh, you may be the first uh, positive speaker on, on on lawyers that I, I've heard from in a long time. So that, that that's great to hear. But one other thing I really wanted to make sure we covered was um, your involvement with developing the professional community. That I, I think you're involved with the Social Science Research Council, and Oliver Wyman is really involved. I know with um, ORX, which is a a, 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 lo- a loss event sharing organization that I think is used by most of the major banks in in the world to to develop their knowledge on on operational risk. Um, one big audience we have for this podcast is is younger professionals who are um, looking to to see how they can grow. You know, in in the legal community, we have we have lots of opportunities for leadership. We have local bar associations, we have national bar associations, we have court systems, lots of things. But for risk management, um, when you're trying to do thought leadership as a younger professional, it can be more more difficult. And so, maybe a little from your experience with those types of organizations. Thank you. Yeah, no, this is I. This is a topic I feel uh, sort of quite near and dear to my heart. Um, um, it is uh, so. The the place where I'm probably sort of most directly involved in this is through the Global Association of Risk Professionals, GARP. Um, so GARP has. Um, uh, you know, I was. I remember very clearly when it was started, well over 20 years ago. Um, uh, and I remember at the time thinking, what, this sort of thing doesn't exist already? It really has to exist. So I was glad that it was formed and it's been quite successful. Um, I think partly because one, it's a nonprofit. So, uh, it, in that sense, uh, you know, is, is, uh, is kind of deliberately education oriented. It's not a, mm-hmm. it's not a, a profit making entity. Um, it is centered around a um, uh, an exam, the financial risk manager exam, sort of inspired by the CFA. Um, 
and um, I'm on the exam committee, so um, it, it is sort of the 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 channel where I feel most uh, where, where I think I could be most effective is to is to influence the curriculum in some sense, like what should risk managers, young risk managers, focus on uh, in in terms of in terms of training and uh, training uh, and getting ready for the profession. So um, so I think uh, you know obviously I put my time. Uh, I, do, I donate my time to this. I care about it. Um, I think that's a. Uh, it's important for for senior, uh, more crusty members in the in the profession like me, to give back to the community in in that way. For Oliver Wyman, you know, since um, we have such a strong uh, kind of presence and reputation in risk management and supporting risk management uh, at. Um, at financial institutions, but also public sector and non-financial institutions increasingly. Um, uh, being involved in in uh, essentially things that serve uh, the public and the profession more broadly is uh, is a uh, you know is a, again a, a way to give back, but also it's frankly in our interest. We want risk management to become uh, more prominent. Uh, in in companies, and this goes beyond just um, uh, beyond just financial institutions. We think it is just inherently good practice to have uh, uh, a, a senior member in an organization dedicated uh, and a group dedicated just to worrying about stuff that can go wrong. Uh, you know, everyone else in a for-profit enterprise is understandably oriented towards uh, a profit making. There are control functions, of course. Um, two very important ones are legal and audit. Um, but uh, the this comes back to a point you made earlier. To have uh, someone or a group um, comfortable with ambiguity and risks, worrying specifically about those uh, risks that might come around the corner, and setting in place governance uh, inside so that there's always a balance between you take this is not about not taking risks. It's about taking risks with your eyes wide open. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, like Oliver Wyman, Mayor Brown's also though a, a profit-making venture. And one of the, the challenges we run into, because we, we have a similar client-centric approach that you do of, of, of trying to help the, the client and, and the community, um, is when, when we are asked to, to on selling our expertise versus building a solution that it's it's really easy for me to to get a proposal uh prospectus a uh, private placement memorandum and say yes this is fine or here's the language you need to put in to make it fine and so there i'm selling my expertise that i'm answering a question can you offer this product is this compliant etc um but then the the flip side of that is is helping clients develop tailored solutions or in-house knowledge um, and, and, you know, it would be great if the same client called me back with the same question every day for 20 years and I got to bill for it. That would be a great career for me. But maybe that wouldn't be in, in their interest because at some point you would think they would learn how to answer that question and they would bring me new questions. So how, how do you manage that tension of you've got 20, 30 years of experience um, that you could just sell expertise every day versus um, teaching clients how to solve their own problems? How, how do you manage that? Um, so one, uh, I, and I imagine you also would get bored if we sell the same thing <laughs> year in, year out. So, yeah. um, I, um, but, um, so I remember very clearly, uh, working with a, uh, large regional bank early in the, uh, stress testing days. And, uh, you know, I think we started working with them in 2014, 2013, something to that general effect, um, to help them set up their program. And, um, I remember that by 20, maybe the 20, after the 2015 cycle, um, they had it down and they said, great. Thank you. We don't need you anymore. You're on your own. And, you know, I I view that and I really mean this. I view that as a real success. Frankly, we were so busy that it's like there was no shortage of work. So that's not that's not a problem. It has been a problem. 
but um, and in that way, I, you know, that I view very much as a success is like the the whole I view like what we as advisors should do and do try to do. And I venture to say are successful the vast majority of time in doing is um, solve. A, you know, we come here to solve a problem. Sometimes the aperture widens. Um, you work closely with a client so that they you know, a lot of it is learning by doing. Uh, then I have another program that I just, you know, we work with a uh, with a bank very intensely for two years. This year is a much more scaled back, and we're just in the kind of quality assurance part of the project. You're on your own. Go do it. We're going to take a look at stuff, uh, not even everything along the way. Uh, and if we see a problem, we'll we'll of course raise our hand and help you fix it. Um, but this year you're largely on your own and that's very much by design that is how it should be done I th and uh and you know in order to add value i think particularly at the sort of more uh um you know more strategic end of the of the consulting spectrum uh you have to stay at the at the forefront um it's you know you have to um uh, it's not it it it's yeah, I mean, arguably, we're too expensive to mm -hmm. to do routine work. The mm -hmm. the bank should do their own. They should do it themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, our job is to help them get to that point. Good perspective. I, I like that that approach. That and you're right. There is a challenge to to doing new things. And and if we went back to to young or little Till and 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 back before the financial crisis and told him that he would be learning all of these these stress testing things and designing these programs. He would probably be awed at, at what his his um, next 15 years was going to be like. Um, thinking about some of the 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 people today who maybe are in those shoes that you once were in, and 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 where operational risk management techniques will evolve, where there may be um, areas of focus that like we already have stress testing, we already have C car. It's um, yes, there's modifications to the scenario design, scenario analysis to the governance frameworks, but um, what are some areas where you see it evolving where where people entering the profession might have that that same wild ride that you had? <laughs> um, it helps to have a big financial crisis for a wild ride. I don't wish that um, uh, on uh, on you know on the world uh, because they cause a lot of damage. And even now, this this very you know in the grand scheme of things, uh, more moderate uh, one that we're going through causes damage and causes. Uh, you know, a lot of hardship. Um, um, our jobs at risk managers is to do our best to prevent that from happening. Um, so, um, so let me actually uh, start from the familiar uh, platform, which is the stress testing. You know, stress testing is just a tool. Frankly, it's not even a new tool. It's one of the oldest tools in risk management. Um, it just took on a new form in 2009 and has morphed a bit since. Um, it is taking, it's expanding and taking on yet new forms, you know, with the last three years. Um, most of the action has been, but not all, in more and more non-financial risks. Pandemic was always in the list, in the risk inventory of banks. Mm -hmm. It wasn't very far at the top. Pandemic was near the top of life insurance companies' um, risk register. Nobody thought it was going to unfold in this way. And in particular, the intersection of political risk and, you know, irrational, you know, seemingly irrational human behavior and the intersection of that with um, uh, with um, with the, the unfolding of the pandemic uh, was not in the models, was not in the thinking. And certainly not sufficiently so. Perhaps my plea again to um, uh, to different disciplines. You don't need to be an economist. You don't need to be a lawyer. You don't mm -hmm. need to be a finance person in order to contribute a lot to risk management. Anthropologists, political scientists, um, uh, even, and philosoph philosophy majors, you have a lot to contribute uh, because you think about the world in a slightly different way um, that is uh, going to be complementary. So um, being really op like having your eyes very wide open about risk possibilities, thinking carefully about how 
the you know about um, channels of contagion that are not immediately apparent. So, you know, the wake up for all of us about the um, the supply chain, for example. You know, yes, there were people who worried about supply chains, but I didn't know a lot of people in banking risk management that worried about supply chains until the supply chain broke. Uh, now we've all become like amateur experts at what supply chains do. Um, what's the next thing that we should be uh, worried about? And so the way I usually approach those problems is uh, I, I think less about actual events. I think more about channels of contagion um, so that no matter what the shock is that is hard to forecast, um, what is I have some hope of understanding the ripple effect, the magnitude, uh, and the the more pervasive damage that that a particular shock can cause. Well, well, Till, thank you for that. And I think with that, we'll probably close out the program. It's been really awesome talking to you today, getting that perspective on on the need for interdisciplinary collaboration in risk management, and also how um, the 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 risks may change, but some of 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 the techniques of of understanding that and and problem solving for those risks, th those will remain with us for many years. So I really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. Um, I also want to thank our audience. Without you, we wouldn't have a reason to do these programs. And so please do tune in for the next um, episode of Credibly Challenged. Have a great day. Thank you so much, Matt. It was great to be here.